Hello, everybody. This is Dave Berkus for Ion Business, and this is the Berkus Report. The Berkus Report takes items from my books, Berkonomics, and gives you short stories about entrepreneurs who have either succeeded well or failed miserably, or given stories about some things that would help entrepreneurs do better in the business that they have. Today, I want to spend time on the change structure of financing, the way in which businesses today get their money. It is new. There are things that have changed during these last two years. And many people aren't aware that so much has changed in the ecosystem for raising money that uh, maybe it's worth a few minutes just to cover that one subject. So first thing we talk about is when you raise money, or at least when you begin a business to raise money, you often put money of your own in. And often that isn't possible, or sometimes you mortgage your house. But whatever it is, we call this our own investment before we begin the next rounds. From that, we usually start looking for money from friends and family and people who know us as individuals. It is the easiest money to get, but in a way, it's the most risky money, not because it comes first, but because the people who raise it don't know how to value the company. So I often propose that these people receive a convertible note, which means the company promises to pay these people either back for the investment or to convert their money, their investment, into the next round, whatever that next round is, at a discount. It's fair to the investor, it's fair to the company, and it doesn't require you to have to price or value the company at the time. Then comes the angel investor. The angel investor usually is either a professional who knows how to value these companies and knows how to make these investments, or somebody who at least is able to do the due diligence, perform the due diligence, and decide whether or not the company has all the structure and the requirements and the legal things necessary, wherever the friends and family don't normally think to do this. So the angel often organizes everything from the capitalization table, that is, the friends and family's investment, all the way through the way in which the company will look and be valued through the next round. During these last several years, we've seen a phenomenon that is really interesting to those of us in the business and important to you as you're looking at how to raise money. And this is the accent, the access of the super angel and the small micro VC fund. Two years ago, there were only one or two of these types of micro VCs. The problem was the angels are able to put in normally as a group about a $450 to $500,000 investment into a company. Friends and families, of course, put whatever they will. And from there, we used to have to jump to venture capital. And it caused what we had called the valley of death, or the area in which people could not find money if they needed $1.5 million or $2 million or $2.5 million to build this company to the next step. What the micro VCs have done, and there are over 100 of them that have appeared during these last two years, is to build funds, small funds, 40 to $75 million funds on the average, that make investments of about one or two million and fill that gap. This wasn't true before, and so it's something to know about. Super angels are people who made themselves money, based usually upon options, which they cashed in when a company went public or was sold, and are now investing themselves that money that they've made in other entrepreneurs. I was a super angel and did that very thing myself. And you'll find that there are many around. They do less due diligence than the angel groups and micro VCs, but they certainly get more involved with the companies that they invest in. So up the line, the next you'd see would be the venture capitalist. The venture capitalist, since the 2003 and 2004 period following the last crash, raised large funds which required them to make large investments. So typically a VC invests $5 million, $7 million, and a lot more sometimes in the company, and therefore requires the company to be further along, both in revenue and in progress as far as what it has done. So the VCs have found something strange. They're now competing against micro VCs. They've been competing against angels, or at least cooperating with angels all this time. And so today, the VCs, the larger ones with the larger funds, are dividing themselves into three. They're creating micro VC funds even smaller than the ones I described, where they will throw a few thousand, hundred thousand dollars at companies just to see what happens. We have a term for that. We call it spray and pray. But it's kind of nice for the entrepreneurs. And then they have micro VC funds, which the VC companies are forming, and of course, late stage or later stage funds as well. So the VCs are no longer quite what you used to know of them two and three years ago. Kind of nice to see that evolution as well, because we have a continuum that we never had before in the past. Then there is, as you probably know well, crowdfunding. Now you think of crowdfunding as a way in which to raise money on, say, Kickstarter. That's non-dilutive money. That means you're raising money by promising to give somebody either a service, a product, or a pat on the back. 
But either way, none of those things dilute or cause the shareholders to give away some of the holdings of the company to others. It's a very good way to raise money. However, there are hundreds of thousands of businesses trying to do so on the various crowdfunding sites today. So your chances of raising the amount of money you seek are a lot lower than they were just a few years ago. However, it is good because it doesn't dilute. And then there are the new forms of crowdfunding. Unfortunately, we use that very same term, unfortunately. The SEC has allowed us now a new rule. Those of us who invested as angels and venture capitalists invested under their rule, which we called 502B, 506B, I'm sorry. And 506B requires that we have a million dollars in equity available to invest or and $200,000 worth of income every year. And that would be the qualification minimum for people in our class. Now, with crowdfunding and the new rule, which is 506C, the person who wants to invest in a small business can do so with certain requirements with only $10,000 of available cash to invest or 10% of their annual income, whichever is smaller. Now, that's a lot smaller. Therefore, it means many more people will enter the field. It is a little more risky for the people taking the investment because this means people are probably giving a bigger piece of themselves every time they invest in one of these companies. But the rules are a little strict. It requires that you invest through a portal or some other source that can verify the amount of money you have to invest. That's bad because a professional investor would never want to give their last three tax returns to a portal and never want to give an attorney the same kind of information. And the SEC is requiring this to be done, at least now the rulemaking says, every quarter, which means you'd have to do this much more often than we who just self-certify. Now, there is one restriction, or at least one available way or loop out, and that is if you're a member of an organized angel group, you do not have to do this. The angel group will certify that you are able to do this and invest under 506C. So these are many of the ways, getting a little more detail than you might want to hear, that you can find cash today that you couldn't have found cash even two years ago. It's a better marketplace today. There's more money available. And there certainly are more businesses graduating from accelerators and coming to the marketplace with new technologies than there were even just three or four years ago. It's a wonderful world for the investor. It's a great world for the entrepreneur. And I hope it is for you, too. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report on Eye in Business. Hello, everybody. This is Dave Burkus for Ion Business, and we call this segment the Burkus Report. During this time, I talk about stories that I've written in several of my books, Burkonomics, Advanced Burkonomics, and Basic Burkonomics, and we talk about business issues by illustrating points with stories about entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs who've crashed and burned, and entrepreneurs who've done very well. And you know, the, one of the first things I like to talk about when in the series is partnerships, because many times entrepreneurs start as simple partnerships. Well, my dad, who was not even a high school graduate, was a very smart business person. And he said, never take on a partner. Well, that's kind of a story that uh, really must have an ending. So let's talk about that just for a second. What would you expect in a good partnership before we talk about the legal structure and whether or not you protect yourself and how you protect yourself with a partnership? First of all, you'd want complementary skill sets, wouldn't you, between the partners. You'd obviously want people who can work well together. That's an important thing as well. And you'd want to have some sort of skills that would allow you to complement the product line or expand the company between the partners. Because the partners themselves often have to give of themselves more than they would pay in the way of wages to other people as well. Some partners give access to new technologies. Some partners give access to cash. So once you've determined what it is you need from the partners that you have. It's not just two guys sitting uh, in a dorm room, and it's not just two people who've known each other since elementary school. It's two or three or more people who can add complementary skills to the business. Well, the first thing I would do if I were forming a partnership would be to determine what kind of structure I would want to have for that partnership. And this may get beyond some of you, but you've got to know it anyway. You can either have a straight partnership in which there's legal responsibility divided by each of the people. And when that happens, if there is a problem, everybody is individually responsible. Or you could form an LLC, which is a corporation, a limited liability corporation. And in forming that corporation, you have helped to protect yourselves individually. 
and given limited liability to each, and each partner becomes, therefore, a part of the corporation. Or you can form a limited partnership. Ordinarily, in a limited partnership, one person acts as a general partner, and that person is the one most responsible for running the business. And the others are a little bit less responsible, and therefore a little bit less liable. But those kinds of organizational decisions are important. And there are tax impacts for these decisions as well. For example, you could form a C corporation. A C corporation is one that pays tax on its own income, but does not pass the tax impact on to the individual members or partners or shareholders. And so a C corporation is a good thing to have if you're making money and have outside investors. Then there is finally the S corporation. An S corporation is ordinarily formed early on the life of a company when partners decide that they would like to take the tax loss early in the life of a company and use that on their own personal returns. The problem is S corporations ordinarily do not take money from outside investors because it passes those losses on to the outside investors. And once the losses turn to income, then they have to worry about the outside investors asking for payouts to be able to pay the tax. So these are questions about tax. These are questions about the structure. And more importantly, it is how these partners get along in creating, or creating an organization that will give you a chance to grow well using all of the partner's talents. Well, there's one more thing I do want to make sure that you know as we talk about partnerships. And it is sometimes, maybe more often than not, some partners end up after a period of time contributing much less than other partners to the business. I know it's always something we assume everybody will do equally when we begin a partnership, but it is very common that I've seen one or two partners either drop out or become less important to the corporation over time. How do you protect yourself against exactly that happening? Well, I recommend that we escrow the stock or the interests of each of the partners for a period of four full years. And each partner earns the stock that they have over a period of 148th every month. What would happen, therefore, if somebody left the business after one year, or if for some reason they decided to part because the skill set was no longer complementary, or the people didn't get along as well together, is that that person who leaves only earns 148th times 12, or one-fourth of all of the stock that that person would have had. No complaints, no screaming, no negotiation. It becomes very easy for everybody involved to know that the partners have to stick around, behave, and be a good part of building the corporation or the partnership over time. Those are just a few of the considerations, but if you're forming a partnership, I would be very careful to make sure that we think of all of those things. Compatibility, tax, and the ability to have a partner who leaves treated fairly when he does. This is Dave Burkus for Ion Business. This is the Burkus Report. All of this came from Basic Burkonomics. Glad to have you with me.